So let's turn over tonight to John chapter 4 this evening, and um, we're going to tuck right into this text. Now this is going to be the first of a few Wednesdays together on John chapter 4. This is a somewhat lengthy chapter, but there's but, but even more than that, it's one of the uh, places where we um, find some, some deep waters, and uh, they're going to be healing waters to us by the end. Uh, there's a well at the start and a pool at the end of the chapter, and uh, so um, from one at the outset, we find um, the one who is the true well, living water, and then at the end of the chapter we find the one who's a great physician who brings healing. Uh, it's the second sign in John's gospel, the uh, healing that takes place there. So we'll, we'll have a, a, a very uh, wonderful time uh, looking into this. Uh, this evening, here in John chapter 4, we come to the second successive interview that Jesus does with an individual. In John chapter 3, we've just been looking at Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus. And now we're going to pick up an interview of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. So we'll just read a few verses together here at the outset. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And um, in Jewish reckoning, that's noon. That's midday. So right in the middle of the day. There came uh, a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where uh, then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty or come all the way here to draw. And that's the gospel of the Lord. So let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your words, which are our life. We thank you that uh, your words are spirit and life, and we pray that the same spirit that inspired the beloved disciple to write these words down would inscribe them on the tablets of our heart. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've got a whole lot of background to do on this, and this is a very long interview. If you look ahead into the rest of the chapter, uh, you can see uh, that this, this conversation will continue to go on for some time, and then the disciples show up in verse 27. They get back from the city. At this point, his disciples came. They were amazed that he was speaking with a woman. 
Yet no one said, what do you seek or what do you speak or why do you speak with her? Then she leaves her water pot and goes to the city and begins to bear witness of Jesus in that city. And, um, and then down in verse 39, a great many of the Samaritans believe. So a remarkable, remarkable work takes, takes place there in that area. So there's, but one of the things that we notice here right away is the tremendous contrast in these two interviews. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus, who, who professionally and religiously is part of the temple complex in Jerusalem. He's a Pharisee, so he is at the very center of the religious establishment of the Jews. So Jesus is meeting with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, the very center of the religious establishment of the Jews, and he meets with him at what time of day? Remember, he comes to him by night. So he comes in the night. And then here in John chapter 4, we meet with a woman. We, meet, we see Jesus meeting with a woman who is what kind of woman? She's a Samaritan woman, and she's at the furthest margins away from the center of Jewish religious life. And Jesus is talking with her at what time? At the middle of the day, at the height of the light of the day. So there's a tremendous literary contrast here that's being drawn for us. And, and, and it's important for us to catch on what's going on there. Uh, and, and this is um, heightened for us uh, by the fact that this woman coming at midday is so unusual. Women did not come to wells to draw in the middle of the day. They came when to get their water for the household? Early in the morning. She comes at midday at the time when no one else is there. She's quite surprised, of course, not only to find Jesus sitting there on his own, but then he, that being a Jew, he would, he would speak to her. And that goes into the a uh, great divide between the Jews and the Samaritans. We'll look at that in just a second. But um, this, this woman must have been a social outcast in her own culture. She didn't go to the well when the other women did. So she is someone who is not only from a theological perspective um, among the Jews, someone who's on the margins because she's a Samaritan, She's a person who's on the margin of the Samaritans. So this lady who Jesus is speaking with is the further, she's as far away as you can get from Nicodemus and the religious center of the Jews. She's way out there. And Jesus is speaking to her and she's amazed that he is talking to her because she's what? A Samaritan. The disciples, when they arrive, are amazed that Jesus is talking to her because she's a woman. So gender and ethnicity and religious background, all of these things are rolled into one, and Jesus is coming to her. And this is a preview of his mission. This is a preview of his whole world mission. And this brings us back to John chapter 1 when John the Baptist first introduces Jesus in the Agnus Dei. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Of the world. That's the shocking part of that announcement. That Jesus has come to save the world. Well, if you want to read a little bit about Jacob's well, you can see that in Genesis 29. You can look that text up later. We're going to major with some other things on the Samaritans themselves. But I want to point out to you here in John chapter 4, just a, a, a particular instance here from a literary standpoint, where this is the very first time that we will read in the gospel where Jesus identifies himself as the Savior and very clearly says it to someone. And that's in verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. Now let's stop for just a second. What kind of woman is she? Samaritan. Don't forget that the Samaritans, and we'll get into this, believe that who's coming? Messiah. They believed in the Messiah too. Messiah is coming. Who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, am he. Literally what it says is, it, it's the ego emi passage. It's I who speak to you, I am. This is, this is 
Uh, in other places in John's Gospel, the I am is translated, like I am the light of the world, or I am the resurrection and the life, or before Abraham was, I am. But the I am is right here in this verse too. And when she says, I believe in the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to open up everything, Jesus says, to her, Jesus says to her, I am, which was an incredible saying. And I'm noting it here so we'll pick up on it as we go the rest of the way through John's Gospel. Because that I am saying goes back to Exodus chapter 3, where God reveals his name to Moses. And God, um, Moses says, Lord, um, they're going to ask me the name of the God who sent me. What is your name? And God says to him, I am that I am. Uh, and the unpronounceable, un, almost untranslatable name of God. I am that I am. So holy it was held on, uh, to be that Jewish lips would never utter the name, and so religiously devout were they in that practice that the actual pronunciation of the name was lost to history. Because to say the name, possibly with unclean lips, would be to take God's name in vain, and so they would never actually say the name. When they would come across it, they would substitute another word. Anybody remember what it was? Yeah, they'd substitute Adonai. Adonai. They'd throw Adonai in, okay? And so that's why sometimes when you're reading through the Old Testament, if you've got an English translation of the Old Testament, you'll see the word LORD in all caps, okay? That's Yahweh, I am that I am. And then other times you'll see Adonai, LORD, and it's not all caps, okay? It's two different words that are being used, all right? But even when they would read the text and they would come to the name which must not be uttered, they would substitute in the other, the, other, the other word because of the sinful lips issue. That, that, that's what Isaiah said. Remember, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. So they didn't even say the name. Now, they don't say, I am. Repeatedly, Jesus keeps saying what? I am. So, so you have to understand how distressing it was to somebody in that culture, to hear someone say those words. You didn't say that. No one said that. And Jesus wasn't simply saying it about God. He was saying it about himself. So you begin to, begin to understand why he incited so much distress, so much angst, so much anger and opposition. All of that's going on. Samaria is part of the Jesus mission to the world. And, and that's why this is set here. In the book of Acts, you'll remember, when the disciples are promised the power of the Spirit for their mission, Jesus says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the remotest parts of the earth. So the Samaritan mission was a big deal, and, and in Acts 8, you read about the Samaritans as a, a larger community of people receiving the gospel, uh, through the ministry of Philip the Evangelist. And in the book of Acts, when that group of Samaritans receive, they do not receive the Holy Spirit. It's a very curious passage. Until the apostles come down and lay hands on them. Now I want you to think about it. Just get this picture for a minute. Here come the apostles. What's their ethnicity? They're Jewish and they're going to Samaria. And the Samaritans, while they've believed in Jesus, have not received the Holy Spirit. They believe Philip's preaching the gospel. They've been baptized, but they haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. Until the apostles from Jerusalem come and lay hands on them. Now, what did that do for the Samaritans in terms of their, the necessity of uniting back with the Jews? Right? We have, we're only going to receive if it's through who? through the Jews. But what did it do for the Jews to come and lay their hands on the Samaritans? So what happened to these people that had been broken apart? Through the gospel and through the work of the Holy Spirit, these people who'd been broken apart were brought together and made one. Now, for us to grasp a little bit more of the significance of that great division being brought back together. We have to know a little bit of what's going on here in this background between the Jews and the Samaritans. And for that, you've got to get back a little bit into the white pages of your Bible. 
uh, the part where the gold leaf is still stuck together, okay? So um, if you go back with me to 1 Kings 16, okay? It's so 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. We're going to be in 1 and 2 Kings for just a little bit here. We've got to give a little background here. 1 Kings 16. And um, we're, if you look at verse, well, let's pick it up here um, in verse 21. Now, a bit of background. At this point that we're reading, there's been a great uh, disruption in the nation of Israel. This is many years after this has occurred, but you'll, you'll know how this goes. After Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam reigned in his place. But Rehoboam was... Um, uh, going to reign at a time when God's judgment on Solomon because of his own infidelity, his own unfaithfulness to God would be visited on Israel. And so uh, Jeroboam is raised up to be an opponent to Rehoboam. So you have the nation of Israel split in two, split into two halves. And the northern kingdom is called Israel and the southern kingdom is called Judah. And so it can be very confusing if you're just reading through the Old Testament for the first time because you're looking at two separate nations with two separate dynasties, royal houses, and one's called Israel and one's called Judah, and you're going, well, who's who here? You, know, you really need a scorecard to keep track of the players, right? And, so, and then, just to make matters a little crazier, when you read in this passage, now we're just going to talk about Israel, the northern kingdom, which are you know, in the, 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 the line of people that have broken away from King David. They're outside the house of David now. They have separate dynasties set up. And there's a, a, there's a civil war that erupts among them, a further division in this northern kingdom called Israel that doesn't have Jerusalem as its capital anymore, is not loyal to the house of David, that dynasty. So verse 21, the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath, to make him king. The other half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri prevailed over the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath. And Tibni died, and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, that's the other, that's the house of David, that's Jerusalem's royal house, Omri became king over Israel. He reigned 12 years. He reigned six years at Tirzah. He bought the hill Samaria from Shemar for two talents of silver, and he built on the hill, and he named the city which he built Samaria, after the name of Shemar, the owner of the hill. So this is where Samaria comes from. So Omri is establishing a new dynasty in Israel, which is a kingdom already in rebellion against the house of David, they're separate from them. And he buys this hill, the hill of Samaria, which is named for the person who originally owned it. But he was an evil king. It says in verse 25, Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord. He acted more wickedly than all who were before him. He walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sins, which he had made Israel sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel with their idols. So Omri dies, and, but he has a son before he dies, and he becomes king in his place. Verse 28, look at the name of Omri's son, Ahab. Now, who does Ahab marry? Jezebel. All right. So after Omri, in Samaria, comes Ahab and Jezebel. And then you have the ministries of Elijah and Elisha ministering in Israel, warning them, telling them, they've got to come back to God. If you don't, if you don't, God's going to allow you to be carried off into captivity. But they weren't listening. Verse 31, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel were before him. All right, and then he rebuilds Jerusalem, and there's a whole thing that goes back there to the book of uh, Joshua, which we won't go into. But this is a person who is, who is living in direct opposition to everything that the God of Israel, the God of Judah, stands for. And uh, he erects uh, Asherah pole, uh, Baal worship, 
And, 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 and basically, uh, what I would suggest to you, it, it, this, this, this worship center that they created looked, um, if you go back and look at it, uh, sort of images of this from, from, uh, that are handed down to us, these are basically uh, phallic and images and female sexual images as well, both male and female sexual images uh, that are, that are um, uh, worshipped as gods, okay? So that's part of what's going on here, is the worship of sex as a god. Uh, of course, we can't relate to any of that today in our culture, but uh, there we are. So let's go back to, now to 2 Kings. Let's fast forward a little bit. We're going to go to 2 Kings, chapter 17 and 18. So if you go with me over there. So we've got this city of, of Samaria. It's the capital city of the opposition to the house of David and to God the Lord. And it's a place of deep idolatry. And um, in 2 Kings 17 and 18, we find, um, and there, there's, there's, there's quite a bit to look here, uh, what, what unfolds. The kings, the king of, of Israel, this northern kingdom at this point is named Hoshea. And it says in verse 4, this is 2 Kings 17, that the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hoshea who had, been, who had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt. And it offered no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. So the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded the land and went up to Samaria, and he besieged it for three years. Now, here at this point, I've got to tell you a little bit about the Assyrians. Okay, the Assyrians were really bad dudes. All right, the Assyrians were a brutal force, uh, and what they would do is conquer a city and then take the bones of the people they had just conquered and then go to the next city and pile them up outside the gate of the city that they were going to want to conquer next. And they would just pile the bones up and they would just sit there and just let you go in and out of the city doing your business looking at the big pile of bones. And then after a week of looking at the bones of the people from the last city they were at, they would say, okay, you can surrender and if you surrender, we're going to take you out of your city and we're going to plant you over here in a new place. If you don't surrender, you get to be the bones of the next, that the next group get to look at. That's the way the Assyrians did things. And then they would also do things like take the skins from the people who the bones were part of and nail them up on the walls of the city. So that was, your, that was what they did for sort of political advertising. Okay, nailing up the, the skins of people from the last place. And so they, they sought to rule by terror. So this is the group of people that are laying siege to Samaria. Ultimately, the city falls. And that means that Israel is carried off into captivity by the Assyrians. This is about 300 years before Judah is carried off to Babylon. It's a long time, about 300 years. All right, the whole history of the United States in that time period. So it's a much longer period away yet that Judah gets carried off into captivity in Babylon. But here's the Assyrians. This came about, verse 7, because the sons of Israel sinned against the Lord who had brought them up from the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord had driven out. The sons of Israel, verse 9, did these things secretly, which were not right against the Lord their God. Moreover, they built for themselves high places in their towns from watchtower to fortified city. So there's this whole thing about idolatry that goes on, and it's described for us here in the rest of this chapter, including child sacrifice. Verse 17, they made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire, practiced divination and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of God, provoking him. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. None was left except the tribe of Judah. And Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God. They walked in the customs which Israel had introduced. And so he gets into this whole thing. And then watch what happens in verse 24. The king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and Kutha and from Ava and from Hamat and Sephar Vaim and settled them in the cities of Samaria in place of the sons of Israel so they possessed Samaria and lived in its cities. At the beginning of their living there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them which killed some of them. All right, now here's what's happened. The people of Israel have been 
that have survived, they've been shipped out. Now who's come in? All these other people from all these other places, they've been shipped in and they're living now in the cities of Samaria. Okay, that's who's there. To the south of them is Judah. That's where Jerusalem is. It's, it's to the south. So if you, were, if you were looking at the thing, it would go Judah and then Samaria and, and then up here is Galilee. And some of you I know believe in the Bible from Genesis to maps. And if you look at the back, you know, you, 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 in the back of your Bible, you can see all that laid out for you. So here's Judah in the south and then Samaria and then Galilee. The interesting thing about John chapter 4 is it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He's down here in Judah. He's got to get up to Galilee, which the shortest route was to go through Samaria. But, of course, the Jews, what? They didn't want to go there. So they would always take the long way around and avoid Samaria. But Jesus is going to go straight through it. So he, he makes a point of going through Samaria. And in Samaria, what has happened is all these foreign people have been settled there. Now, there was a belief in the ancient world that gods were tied to geography. God of the hills, God of the valley, God of the water, God of the streams, God of the oceans, all these different gods. And so when this plague of lions is breaking out there, here's the explanation that's given. Um, verse 29. Uh, well, let's see, verse 27. The king of Assyria said, Take there one of the priests whom you carried away into exile, let him go and live there, and let him teach them the custom of the God of the land. So, here's what the king of Assyria says. I want you to go, go get a priest, a Samaritan priest, who's, who's part of the old Israelite establishment, who's loyal to the original God of that land. You remember Jeroboam set up a separate worship center in Samaria, okay? Bring him back there and let him teach these foreigners who the God of this land really is. So they can do the stuff. And then they won't be cursed anymore. Okay? So they go and find a priest. Verse 28. One of the priests that they had carried away into exile from Samaria came back and lived at Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Very interesting, isn't it? But every nation still made gods of its own and put them in the houses of the high places which the people of Samaria had made, every nation in their cities which they lived. The men of Babylon made Sukkoth Benoth, the men of Kuth made Nergal, the men of Hamath made Ashima. Aren't you glad that that's not one of the verses you were asked to read during your neighborhood Bible study, right? You're like, oh, I got that one with all the weird names in it. So, verse 32. They also feared the Lord and appointed among themselves priests of the high places who acted for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods according to the customs of the nations from among whom they had been carried away into exile. To this day, they do according to the earlier customs. They do not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances or the law or the commandments which the Lord commanded the sons of Jacob, whom he named Israel with whom the Lord made a covenant. Well, what's going on here in this passage is that, is that these, these people now are a mixed group. They're people from all the other nations, and they've been settled here in Israel, in Samaria. And a priest has come back and taught them about God, the God of Israel, and they believe in the God of Israel, but what do they do with the God of Israel, really? They just add him to all their other gods. So there's this part of the land of Israel, Samaria, where Yahweh, God, the Lord, is worshipped, but he's worshipped in a very mixed way. And so the people in Judah, when they came back, said those people in Samaria are really goofed up. And they're, however bad we were, they were worse. Because even though they, we all went into captivity, we didn't go into captivity for another 300 years. So God kept, you know, he kept working with us for a little longer. And, 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 and when they came back, they did the ultimate thing. They tried to, um, and it's called syncretism, when you try to combine these irreconcilable religions. So the way the Jews in Jerusalem viewed the Samaritans was this. These people are half-breeds ethnically. And from a religious standpoint, they're total heretics. Okay, so we'll have nothing to do with these people. 
they would make us unclean. They are always the people who are going to introduce idols. But isn't it interesting that the Samaritan woman says to Jesus, I know that who's coming? Messiah is coming. The Samaritan vocabulary for that was Tahib. The Tahib is coming. He is the one who's going to put all things to right. They built their own temple about 400 years before Christ's time on Mount Gerizim, and it was destroyed by the Judean ruler, John Hyrcanus. He destroyed it. So that furthered the antipathy between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritan temple at Mount Gerizim was not destroyed by the Romans or the Greeks, right? It's destroyed by the Jewish forces. And so the conflict over what the proper religious center is, is it Jerusalem or is it Gerizim, both of those, that, that conflict is right at the heart of national identity. I'm a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, I'm loyal to Gerizim, I'm loyal to Jerusalem, you guys destroyed our temple, you've always treated us like, you know, and all of that is, and into the middle of this conflict, which is centuries deep, steps Jesus and starts to talk to this woman who's a Samaritan, who's waiting for Tahib, though she herself is on the margins of her own marginal culture. That's the setting. Now, in John chapter 3, Jesus is referred to by John the Baptist as the bridegroom. Remember, John the Baptist said, I'm the friend of the bridegroom, but the bride belongs to the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. And then, right after that, see, that's at the end of John chapter 3. I, I, that's at the end of John chapter 3, um, verse 29. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. As soon as he says that, we turn to John chapter 4, and we've got Jesus at a well. Now, just bear with me, okay? John chapter 2, Jesus' first sign takes place where? Wedding at Cana, right? And who, who is he in that passage? Okay, whose job was it to supply the wine? Bridegroom. Bridegroom's job to supply the wine. But the wine's what? It's gone. It's run out. So Mary turns to Jesus and he, she says, you supply the wine. Because Mary knows what? He's the true bridegroom. And the, the man who's the master of the feast doesn't recognize who Jesus is. He doesn't recognize him as the true bridegroom. He goes up to the, the bridegroom at the, at the wedding and he says, you've saved the best wine for now. And, of course, that bridegroom is looking at him going, what? What are you talking about? And so quietly in the background, here's Jesus the bridegroom. And then in John chapter 3, because he's the one who supplies the wine, and boy, does he supply wine. No running out of the Jesus wine, okay? That bridegroom's taking care of his bride. Then in John chapter 3, John the Baptist says he's the bridegroom. Now in John chapter 4, we've got Jesus with a woman where? At a well. Now, this is where it gets a lot of fun. Because that stuff back there in Kings and all that, that probably wasn't that much fun, was it? I mean, it's, it's Samaritans and ch child sacrifice, and that's not real cool. But let's go to Genesis. Actually, yeah, let's go to Genesis first. Genesis 24. Now, Genesis 24 is right in the middle of the book, and it's the longest narrative section of the whole book. And it's a story all about how a man finds a bride for the chosen son, and where does the man who's the servant find the bride for the chosen son? At a well. The servant of Abraham goes to find a bride for Isaac. And that takes place all the way through Genesis chapter 24. So here's this, um, and let's see where I want to pick this up. Uh, verse, verse, um, let's do it, verse 10. The servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand, and he arose and he went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. 
And he, he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when the women go out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the well, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you've appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I'll know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. Well, you know how this goes. Rebecca comes out and she says, would you like it? You know, she gives, she gives the servant a drink and she waters the camels too. And he goes, well, oh, praise God, you're the chosen bride. And she goes, what are you talking about? You know, and so off that goes. But this isn't the last time we run into a woman at a well and a wedding taking place. Look over at chapter 29, Genesis 29. Now in Genesis 29, Jacob, who is the son of Isaac and Rebekah, goes on his journey. He came to the land of the sons of the east, and he looked and he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it, and so on, where it's all going to be watered. Verse 4, Jacob said to them, my brothers, where are you from? And they said, we're from Haran. He said, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, we know him. And he said, well with him. They said, what's well? Well. Here is Rachel, his daughter, coming with the sheep. Behold, it is still high day. It's not time for the livestock to be gathered. Water the sheep, go pasture them, and so on. So they say, well, we can't, we can't do this until everything's gathered. And then they roll the stone away from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. Rachel comes with her father's sheep because she was a shepherdess. And when, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Can I just talk to you for a minute about a, a bridegroom who rolls the stone away? I mean, does anybody picking up on any of that? Okay, so you roll, okay. So the bridegroom rolls the stone away in order to bring life to uh, the chosen bride. Anyway, so here's a, he finds his bride at the well. It's not the last time. Look over at the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. In Exodus 2, verse 15, Moses has fled from Pharaoh in Egypt. And it says when, well, when Pharaoh heard about this matter, he tried to kill Moses. Moses fled from uh, the presence of Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian and he sat down by a well. What is Jesus doing in John chapter 4? He's sitting at the well, just like Moses did. The priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds would come, came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And uh, so all this goes on. Um, Moses stays with the man and he has given his bride out of their daughters. Verse 21, her name was Zipporah. And she gave birth to a son, Gershom. So Moses finds his bride at the well. Repeatedly in the Old Testament, the chosen servant comes to the well and at the well finds the bride. And so in John chapter 4, and remember, who's the, who, who, which well is this? Jacob's well. Here comes the chosen servant and he sits down and he has a conversation with a woman at the well. What's it about? Well, they start off talking about water. But then Jesus says to her, go and get somebody and bring him here. Who does Jesus tell her to go and get? Her husband. And she says, don't have a husband. Who's Jesus? That's the bridegroom. Who's that woman? That's the bride. Now, go call your husband. Brings her to the place where she realizes that the true husband, the ultimate Jacob at the well, is calling her. And what Jesus does here 
is incredibly radical because he makes a bride out of a Samaritan woman who is marginal ethnically and religiously, and she's marginal in her own culture. Why is she marginal in her own culture? Well, she says, I don't have a husband. I've got what? Jesus says, Jesus says, well, that's true. You've had what? You've had five, and the guy you're living with right now isn't your husband. Now, here's how I think we basically read that story. I think basically we read this story like this woman's not very good at marriage. Okay? She's just not very good at getting, you know, staying married. She's a, she's a, she's a tart. Okay. But that's not really the story. You know, remember how the Samaritans were looking for the Messiah? Let me tell you something else the Samaritans still did. They practiced the Leverite um, way of remarriage after the death of a brother. So if the husband dies, who marries? Her. The brother. For her. Okay. They didn't, women weren't running around divorcing their husbands in those days. That's not the way the thing worked. You all understand that? That's not how it worked. If she's had five husbands, what does that tell you? They all died. They all died. Which makes her look like what? She's... <laughs> this is a dangerous gal. Okay? Any guy who marries her, what? Dies. So the guy that's living with her goes, ah! I'll stay with her, but not marrying her. Smart man, right? <laughs> so in the passage, they go through this whole back and forth, which we'll get deeper into on the water and the well and, and the, the, the water becoming a well in you. We'll tackle that next week and the worship in spirit and truth and all this kind of thing. But I want to bring you to the, the culmination of the conversation. The Messiah is coming. I'm the Messiah. Verse 20, 28. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city. What did she come there for? Water. What did Jesus promise her? And if you drink it, what? So guess what she doesn't need anymore? I don't need this water pot anymore. She leaves it behind. Every time people in the Gospels meet Jesus, they leave stuff behind. James and John and Andrew and Peter leave behind what? They leave their nets. And Bart blind Bartimaeus, he leaves behind his cloak. I don't need this blind man's cloak anymore. And this woman leaves behind her water pot. Every time somebody meets Jesus, they leave behind the thing that they thought they needed most to live because Jesus has become their life. This man is now my life. I've got the water I need. And she goes back into the city, the city of the Samaritans. Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and they were coming to him. The disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat. And we'll get into this whole thing about food and so on. We'll, we'll pick that up. But I want you to, uh, he, he, this is where the whole issue about uh, the harvest being white um, and, and ready to be reaped. They would have never imagined Samaria, Samaria as a harvest field. The harvest is often right where you think it isn't. All the places you think God wouldn't dare move. Those are the places God is moving. We'll, get, we'll come back to that. Verse 39. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, saying, he told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. We've heard for ourselves and know that this is the one who is indeed the, say it with me, Savior of the world. Not just the Savior of the Samaritans, not the Savior of the Jews, the Savior of 
the world. God is in a world project that is taking ethnicities which are broken apart and bringing them back together. Now, what's going on here? This woman goes back to the city. She leaves a water pot behind and goes back to the city and says to the men of the city, to the men of the city, come on. It's a woman telling men, come to Jesus. Okay? Same thing happens at the end of the Gospels. Because who's the, who, 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 who understands that Jesus has been raised from the dead? Mary, she comes back to the apostles and says, I've met him. He's alive. The body's not, he's alive. And then, okay. So she comes back. And this is a fulfillment, really. She's working here as um, the voice of wisdom from the book of Proverbs. From the book of Proverbs. Where the wise woman calls out to the men of the city, come to the feast that I've prepared. There are two kinds of women in the book of Proverbs who are crying out. There's the harlot woman and the wise woman, and who is wisdom. And she cries out. She says, come to my feast. The other woman says, come to my feast too, but it leads to death. The woman who is wisdom calls out to the men, come to my feast. And they come to the feast, and it's the feast of life. And she is fulfilling that kind of note. And what this means is that something radical has happened to her. She has become someone now that they don't shun She's now at the center of their community. She's the one that they're going to listen to. They heed her words. They come and meet. They come out to the well to see Jesus, who's still out there having an argument with his disciples about bread. All right? And they come out there, and they, and they say, and they listen to what Jesus has to say, and they're so amazed by what Jesus has to say, this Jew, that they say to a Jew, do what? Stay with us. Stay with us. And he stayed. He stayed. Jesus goes to the outsiders and he finds the person on the furthest marginal place. And that's the person he uses to bring that whole area to himself. And he stays with them. He stays with the marginalized. He stays with the despised. He stays with the forsaken. And that's a really important and critical matter. Because of the story of another Samaritan in the Gospels. Okay, there's an injured man lying on the road, the road to Jericho. Who passes by and doesn't help? Priests, the Levite, all those people, because they're what? They're holy, and this guy might be dead or dying, and if they touch him dying or dead, then what happens? They're ceremonially unclean. They can't go do their thing. But who stops to help the man? A Samaritan. A Samaritan. Because what's a Samaritan got to worry about, right? I mean, come on. So the whole thing there, who's my neighbor? The Samaritan proves to be the neighbor because he cares. He, he the Samaritan passes over the boundary lines. The Samaritan reaches out back to the Jews and takes care of the wounded person. And Jesus is, of course, saying in that parable, I'm the Samaritan. I'm the Samaritan who reaches out to the broken and the battered and brings them in. I'm making these people my neighbor, and I'm calling you to be like me and reach out past the margins and bring in the broken and bring in the hurting because of who I am. When Jesus stayed with the Samaritans, did he become unclean? No, he didn't. When Jesus touched lepers, did he become unclean? No. In Mark chapter 5, when the woman with the issue of blood touches Jesus, does Jesus become unclean? No. Even though he's holy and he's touched by the unclean, whether it's leprosy or the Samaritan culture or the woman with the issue of blood, he doesn't become unclean. What happens? The leprosy is healed and the blood flow stops and the Samaritans are saved. This is a complete reversal of everything in the Old Testament that said if the holy is touched by the unholy, then the holy becomes what? Unholy. This is a complete reversal. Now the holy has entered into the unholy. He had to go through Samaria. 
He didn't skirt around it. He didn't try to avoid it. He dives into the deep. This is Shawshank Redemption stuff. He is swimming through that pipe on the way to the stream. He is going to the lepers, going to the unclean, because their uncleanness cannot taint him. Their contact with him will heal them. And the church is the body of Christ. It has never been called to be a city with walls up so that the unholy and the unclean can't touch us. To the contrary, we're called to dive into the middle of it because far from tainting us, the presence of Jesus will do what? Heal them. We are world invaders, not world deniers. And we go into the world because God's on a world mission. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away what? The sins of the world. And this narrative is particularly at the root of what Paul develops in his theology in Ephesians and in Galatians about the fact that the Gentile Jewish divide is over. There is one new humanity. It is in Christ. There is now neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And that fulfills an incredible prophecy from Isaiah 49, which I'll, I'll close with tonight. We've done a lot of work with the Old Testament, but it's really necessary this evening. In Isaiah chapter 49... In Isaiah 49, now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God is my strength. He says, okay, this is God speaking to the servant. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. That's a great mission, but it's too small. I will also make you a light of the nations, the Gentiles, the Goyim, the Ethnos, so that my salvation may reach where? The ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One, to the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see and arise. Princes will also bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who is chosen. The mission of Jesus was to save Israel. You shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Right. But the mission of Jesus was not only to save Israel, it was to save Samaritans and Tennesseans and Texans and to let no more distinctions be made, to gather them all as one. God said, yes, go save Jacob, go save Israel, but that's too small a mission for you. I'm going to give you a mission to save the whole world. And the great temptation of the church is constantly to, to take that great world mission and just kind of go, you know, let's set that over here. That's really not, that's not a big priority. No, 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 that is the mission. That's the mission. We're not trying to create a church to keep people out. Holy boundaries, we're trying to create a church that understands it's on a mission into the world because that's where God is going. Amen? All right. Well, we'll stop there this evening. We'll come back to a lot of the details in this passage next week, especially on the living water and the wells and all that stuff. And we'll get into spirit and truth and worship and all that. But I, wanted, I had to do the big picture thing, okay? Get you the, bride and the, bride, the bridegroom and the bride there. So we've got time for some questions. Richard? There was an intermarriage that happened there, yes. That, that was part of the mix, too. Yeah, you're, you're quite right. Yeah. Why does it seem like this American woman is always portrayed as, or like portrayed as kind of the harlot? You know, I never, I never really thought that until I read the book. Um, and then when I read the book, I was like, oh, she's shady. It's assumed. 
It's just kind of assumed in the text. And part of that, to be completely honest with you, is misogynistic commentary. It's just men thinking the worst of women. And so culturally with him Basically. talking to a woman, like what, in the, would, what was the norm in the day? They would never have had any kind of interaction at all, especially alone. Okay. Just, I mean, there's no one around. It, 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 it's, it's Jew and Samaritan, and then it's male and female. And he would never have spoken to a woman uh, like that. That would have been completely outside the normal bounds. And if you think about even the synagogue of the day within Jewish culture, this is one of the radical things about the New Testament church. If you think about the Jewish synagogue, the women and the children were never allowed to sit in the main gathering. They were always back over there, separate. And so one of the things that you run into in Corinthians is Paul giving instruction about women prophesying precisely because women are part of the assembly. So of course they're speaking in the assembly because now women are full partners in the priesthood. They become part of the royal priesthood. By the way, and I forgot to mention this, it's on your notes. Uh, this woman is given a name uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy. In or Eastern Orthodox theology, they call her Photina, which means the enlightened woman. Now, of course, that's not really, who knows what her name was? It doesn't say in the text, but they just refer to her as Saint Photina. And that's her, uh, that's a little iconography there on your notes. You just kind of go, that's how she's portrayed there at Jacob's Well. And I th is the other picture on the notes, too, of um, the well at the back? That's um, the shrine over the very well. If you ever get over to the Holy Land, you can, you can go to the well of Jacob. And they build a church over it, of course. <laughs> so there you go. Right. Okay, so back to the, um, the whole parable with the Good Samaritan. Yeah. So are we interpreting it wrong the whole time? Because it's the Sunday school lesson. I feel like I've always gotten the, be the one who helps. Is it more of a story of Jesus? Or it, it, Jesus is, yeah, it's, 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 all the stories are actually about Jesus, right? But so Jesus is always really the subject of his parable. It, it, it is about you being the good neighbor to be you. But so he's saying to Jewish people, you have to act like a Samaritan, which they're, what's going on in their brains? What? Right? Okay. So the, but Jesus is the ultimate good Samaritan. He's the foreigner who comes and heals the broken, and he's not worried about being made unclean. But that never really gets preached much. And, and it, 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 what it gets reduced down to is moralism. You should just be a better person. But the only hope we have of being good neighbors to our neighbors, loving neighbors to our neighbors, is because Jesus has loved us and been the Samaritan who found us broken and battered by the road and healed us and paid the price for our healing. Charge it all to my account, he says. Remember that? Yeah. Okay, so expanding a little bit on, on your question, um, the person who's coming and doing the deed, which is the known one to be there, perhaps yeah. it might be because she was uh, so bad that the Jews and Christians didn't like this, but she was just a good Samaritan. In, in a way. Right. Woman was powerless in that situation. Yeah. Yep. You know, she just wasn't allowed. It wasn't because she was so bad. No, she wasn't bad, but she's viewed as bad. So, so nobody's going to have anything to do with her. The other women don't want to have anything to do with her. Right? So she can't gather with the other, other women, either in the morning or in the evening, to gather water. She comes in the middle of the day when she, she knows no one else is going to be there. And she is living with a guy. And we meet people like that all the time, by the way. And it's very easy for religious people to go, well, why are you living with that person? You know, you're, you're, you're in fornication or whatever, you know. Why are you doing that? Why are you an addict? You know, that kind of stuff. Eee. Of course, that's, that's not what Jesus did with people, is it? Next week. No, it's all good. That's what I said. Got to give you the big picture, and then next week we're going to kind of narrow in on some of those, the well, the water, the, the temple, spirit and truth, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He brought him some Samaritan grub. And they're, eat. 
my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. So the food of God's will. So yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Adonai. They're, uh, well, they, they would write the name, okay, but only with prayer, okay? So there's the, there's the it's Y-H-W-H is the way we would put it in English. There's actually no vowels in the word. The vowels show up only in ancient biblical Hebrew with little marks, you know. So, so uh, no one actually knows how to pronounce it. So they're kind of making, you know, whatever, not, not even today, no one knows. So, uh, so they, they, they would write the name, and then pray before they wrote it. You can imagine how long it took to write the text of Scripture if every time you came across the name of God, you had to stop and pray. And then, then after you wrote it, stop and pray again. So, uh, so that's what they did. And, and so, but they wouldn't, so they wouldn't speak it. And Adonai was part of the text. That's a part of the text. Like the Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh says, but, but that terminology, and Jehovah, Jehovah, the word Jehovah is a, a word, a neologism that was invented by William Tyndale. Um, he just came up with it. He was looking for a way to, a name of God, to try to take Yahweh and turn it into an English form that he could use. Jehovah. It's very offensive to Jewish people. And Jehovah is, yeah saying that name. And that's why uh, even in Roman Catholic circles, that name, they don't even use that word anymore. Um, they won't allow any, any English versions that use Jehovah to be used and deference to their Jewish neighbors, sensitivity to the Jews. It's very interesting. That happened about six years ago. Yeah. One more, and then we got to go. He fulfills it perfectly, doesn't he? Yeah, his lips aren't, aren't unclean. Are There's no danger of his being unclean lips, right? Yeah, so he's, he's, he's very bold what he's doing there. Well, let's pray as we go. Lord, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you, Jesus, that you have come to us in your thirst. You, your thirst brought you to us and made us your own. And we pray that you will keep us ever your own, your true bride, our true bridegroom. Thank you for your love for us. Amen. Just as a preview, it's not the last time in John's gospel you'll hear Jesus say, I'm thirsty.